So first, uh, thank you for register for this Zoom roundtable because of your participants, our research and our activities become more meaningful. Also, I have to say our sincere thanks for the University of Notre Dame and University of Baptist, a Baptist University of Hong Kong for their sponsorship, especially for the Institute for Asian and Asian Studies, Department of History, Notre Dame International. Without their sponsorship, uh, this event could not be happen, could not happen. Uh, it's my honor to invite uh, Professor Golden uh, from uh, Pennsylvania University and Professor Cliff Ando from University of Chicago as two speakers. So this uh, round table, legal philosophy and legal practice in early China and Rome Empire is a second round table in our series entitled Law, Justice and Empire in Comparative Studies. So this series aims to bridge the East with the West. But also, we want to march out of antiquity. We want to bridge the ancient history with modern practice. So that's the reason when we invite discussant, we always try to go beyond the early history field, get some expert in the modern day period or in political science, social energy. So this time we are honored to invite Professor Kylie, uh, the modern legalist professor to as a discussant. So uh, without further ado, I will give the round table forum to our speakers and discussant. Each speaker will have 15 to 20 minutes present their own research. Uh, then Professor Kiley, as discussant, would have 10 to 15 minutes to talk its significance or how to bridge different studies in different civilizations or in different time periods. Then we will devote it to conversation between different scholars. Then at last, we will have time to uh, you know, have question answer sections. Okay. Professor Golden, are you ready? Okay, I will stop sharing. Thank you. So let me try once again to share my screen. And if you could just confirm that it's working. Wonderful. Okay. 90% um, of the time it works. Every once in a while it does. So how realistic was early Chinese legal philosophy. Archaeologically recovered sources, starting with the Qin laws from Shui Hudi, excavated in 1975, then including corpora from Zhang Jiashan, 1983, Liye, 2002, and other sites, have revolutionized our understanding of early Chinese law. Gone are the days when one could simply repeat the factoid that the Qin regime was brutal as though this were sufficient to explain its astonishing rise. Gone too are the days when one could perpetuate the disdainful fiction that China had no significant legal culture. Although the Qin laws were indeed severe by our standards, they also observed rational legal principles and sedulously enumerated the rights of various classes of persons. Moreover, the material from Zhang Jiachan has shed unprecedented light on the transition from the Qin to the Han dynasties, with the counterintuitive result that we now have more detailed knowledge of early Han law than of later Han law. Future discoveries will undoubtedly require us to amend our theories again and again. And um, there are a couple of recently discovered legal corpora from the Eastern Han uh, awaiting eager research. Uh, in this field, unfortunately, we have the situation that sometimes the sources appear more quickly than we can read and analyze them. While the scholarship on these new sources has generally been strong, one area has been neglected, the underlying philosophy. Largely because of Qin's reputation for inhumanity, 
a common assumption has been that the so-called legalist school, Fatya, must have played a role in the formulation and promulgation of these texts. But enough time has elapsed since their discovery to permit a reconsideration of this cliche. Because I've discussed misconceptions about Fadja elsewhere, I offer no more than a summary here. First, the translation legalism is objectionable because fa, which literally means standards, models, or methods, refers to more than just laws. Fundamentally, fa were understood as impersonal administrative protocols whose purpose was to eliminate sources of inefficiency such as favoritism and traditional aristocratic privilege. More on this definition in a moment. More importantly, the category is incoherent and anachronistic because Simatanu probably coined the phrase Fajia, did so for the purpose of caricaturing other positions as foils to Daojia, um, the name that he gave to his preferred philosophy. Thus, none of the supposed adherents of the school ever called themselves Fajia. And accordingly, we cannot even identify the targets of Samatan's critique with certainty. Two texts, Shang Jin Shu, the Book of Lord Shang, and Han Feizi, are almost always included in the group, but scant consensus reigns thereafter. Does Guanzi count too? If the answer is yes, then many commonplaces about legalism no longer hold, notably its alleged amoralism. But if the answer is no, then how do we explain chapters such as Chi Fa, the seven kinds of Fa, that expound on Fa in an administrative context? Or what about Haguanza, the master of the pheasant's cap, which uses the word Fa dozens of times in senses that include natural model, organizational principle, and human law? Today, I'll address a related problem. The tenets of Shang Jin Shu and Han Feizi conflict with the texts from Shui Hudi, Zhang Jiashan, and Li Ye in several respects. The purpose is not to belabor my objections to the category of legalism, but to highlight underappreciated distinctions between legal philosophy and practice. It turns out that Shang Jin Shu and Han Feizi are not very good guides to the laws of the Qin and Han dynasties. Because they were polemical works rather than legal handbooks, it was probably a mistake for our field ever to have su uh, supposed otherwise. First, filial piety and its discontents. One conspicuous area of divergence is xia, filial piety, one of the oldest virtues in the Chinese tradition. And Feizi regards xia for all its prestige as a distracting ideal that only leads subjects to avoid military responsibilities. And in the interest of time, I won't read through all of these translations, but I'll have them on the screen um, as I discuss them. And uh, they're, they're short and clear enough that you can follow along. Uh, here is a deserter who justifies uh, running away from the battlefield um, because he has to take care of his aged father. Or here, another example from Han Feza, one might cultivate filial piety and reduce one's desires like these two paragons. Um, but if they would not engage in battle, of what benefit were they? The references to Confucius and one of his most famous disciples, Master Tung, convey the opinion that Xiao is a distinctively Confucian virtue and from the point of view of the ruler, an unwelcome one. For if Xiao can be freely invoked as an excuse for desertion, the state has no hope of fielding a dependable army. The text might also be suggesting that Xiao is mere self-interest dressed up as virtue. How convenient for the soldier's cowardly impulse, how convenient that the soldier's cowardly impulse to stay alive coincides with his pious concern for his father. The most notorious criticism of Xiao in Shang Jin Shu also asserts that it saps the people's will to fight. This statement seems calculated to offend by execrating as many conventional scriptures as, and values as the authors could think of. Rights, music, oaths, documents, goodness, self-cultivation, the entire kitchen sink. The rhetorical strategy, though not, of course, the core philosophy, is reminiscent of that of Lao Tzu which also shocks the reader by slaughtering one sacred cow after another. The import is clear. The ruler must not allow Xiao to undermine his authority over his people. 
Thus, it was initially surprising to learn that Xiao was a recognized legal concept in the Shui Hudi texts. For example, if a father wished to have his son executed for unfiliality, Wu Xiao, he could simply walk into the local government office and fill out the appropriate form. The only limit was that he was not permitted to kill his children without authorization. I would explain the considerable privilege that the Qin state accorded male heads of household, not as a vestige of Confucianism, as one often reads. Otherwise, it should be noted, there is no trace of Confucian thinking in the Shui Hudi texts, but as an indication that the state was not yet prepared to disestablish a father's traditional authority. It is important to remember the characterizations in Shang Jinshu and Han Feizi notwithstanding, that Xiao is much older than Confucianism and was esteemed by non-Confucian traditions as well. At any rate, in arguing for a society without Xiao, the authors of Shang Jinshu and Han Feizi were unrealistic at best. Not only were they unable to eradicate it, but the cult of Xiao remarkably strengthened, starting almost immediately in the Western Han Dynasty with little opposition until the May 4th movement. Next example, the unrealistic goal of universally applicable laws. Another important difference. Zhang Jinshu and Han Feizi often advocate the universal and equal application of the law, but this goal was not pursued, let alone realized, in pre-modern China. In the early empire, there were two reasons. First, the same crime could be adjudged very differently, depending on the relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. And second, a person's legal status determines the degree of punishment that he or she would suffer upon conviction, or indeed whether any crime was committed at all. As an example of the first, beating one's parent was always regarded as a more serious crime than beating one's child. Under most circumstances, the latter was in fact legal, and because children were debarred from testifying against their parents, any accusation of abuse would have to be brought by a third party. The unequal application of the law was an intended consequence of the elaborate early system of ranks of merit, which were originally awarded for military achievements, later also for other forms of service. Upon conviction, holders of a sufficiently high rank had the option of surrendering it in order to save themselves or their spouses. The rationale was that they or their ancestors must have done a good deed in order to earn the dignity in the first place. A bad deed now cancels it out. At least in later times, it was permissible to purchase the requisite rank for the express purpose of avoiding punishment by promptly cashing it back in. Similarly, some public punishments could be redeemed, that's true, for a specified sum. Poorer convicts lacking rank or wealth would instead be subject to penal labor or worse, possibly mutilation. One might be reminded of the increasing number of indigent American defendants who, quote, are imprisoned for failing to pay legal debts that they can never hope to manage, unquote. That's from an ACLU report. Although this situation is regarded as a failure of the US justice system, whereas in early imperial China, it was by design. Those who could not afford to make financial restitution for their crimes would have no recourse but to pay with their bodies. Since dependents of convicts were typically seized by the government and sold into slavery, often sexual slavery in a government brothel, it is worth reflecting on the vastly dissimilar prospects facing wives and unmarried children of convicts of different classes. At the top, a household might endure no more than a demotion, not trivial, but nothing compared to the fate that awaited families of lower status who could immediately be enslaved for a crime that they did not even commit. Here the logic was that dependents were reckoned as part of the convict's estate, including movable and immovable goods, which the government would also confiscate. In addition to such rank-based disparities, there were what I have called status-related responsibilities that applied to some subjects, but not others. Artisans and government officials, for example, were liable for prosecution in ways that others were not. The punishments for malfeasance or even just inaccurate accounting or shoddy workmanship could be significant. One instructive case shows that the chief, Yen, or an elder's law of a community were responsible for responding to a hue and cry. 
and hence could be punished for mere absence at the fateful moment, but ordinary villagers were not. If one were to suppose that Shang Jingshu and Han Feizi reliably represented early Chinese legal culture, one would have no inkling of such inequities. One of the basic propositions of Han Feizi is that rewards and punishments must be dispensed without regard for rank or reputation. It stands to reason, referring to the passage here on the screen, that by not currying favor with the noble or passing over deserving commoners, an administration guided by Fa would disappoint anyone expecting traditional privileges based on social status. Elsewhere, Han Feizi refers to Lord Chang himself, whose radical reforms alienated bigwigs unaccustomed to submitting to the same protocols as mere husbandmen. At one juncture, Chang Jinshu upholds the same ideal of equality before the law, explicitly denying that past service should be considered when meeting out punishment. Um, where are we? Great. Those who had merit previously, but later failed, the punishment is not to be reduced. Elsewhere, however, the authors evidently recognize that the law does not really work like this, as they describe a world much closer to what we now know from the Shui Hudi and Zhang Jiaxian text. If you have the right rank, um, you could trade it in, your rank will be terminated, but you'll avoid conviction, which in early China was a grim fate. Occasionally, the political philosophers acknowledge that society lags behind their vision. Next section, different meanings of the key word fa. In Han Feizi, the meaning of fa is clear and consistent. An impersonal administrative technique of determining rewards and punishments in accordance with a subject's true merit. The term has more to do with recruitment and staffing than with law. You have to use fa to judge who has performed, who has not performed, who deserves to be rewarded, who deserves to be punished. In this respect, Han Feizi is not entirely original. The Shenzhou fragments include an older and perhaps even more limpid discussion. We have to uh, reward and punish according to Fa so that everybody knows that the outcome is fair. We're going to be uh, judged and rewarded according to our performance, not anything like um, favoritism. Only recently have scholars come to appreciate that this is not quite how Fa is used in excavated legal sources, where it serves as a terminus technicus of uncertain meaning. Diverse suggestions have been published, the most compelling in my view, being that of Miranda Brown and Charles Sant. Quote, categories intended to guide the official to the relevant statutes. My own phrase for this would be legal paradigms. Some of their best evidence centers on larceny. That's da. When an official borrows or lends government property at interest, privately and without authorization, the borrower and the lender will be fined two ounces of gold. Whether it be cash or gold, hemp and cloth or silk, grain or rice, or horses or oxen, the offense is in the same category as larceny. The diction reflects the penchant for analogizing in Chinese jurisprudence. There are models, fa, for adjudicating uh, on larceny, and over time, other crimes are treated as though they were in the same category, including some that would not be classified as larceny in most modern legal frameworks, such as causing injury to livestock by recklessly leaving traps. This is noticeably different from the sense of fa in ph philosophical texts, legalist and non-legalist alike. Concluding reflections. There are, to be sure, respects in which the newly recovered legal sources do exemplify the philosophy of Shang Jinshu and Han Feizi. The system of ranks of merit succeeded in replacing the old aristocracy with a hierarchy of subjects who were entitled to graded privileges by virtue of their service rather than their birthright, that is, replacing inalienable rights with alienable ones. Now you have a privilege because you served, 
and we can take it back if we're no longer happy with you. As opposed to in the past, you have a privilege because of uh, your birth, your surname, your grandfather, and it's very difficult for the state to claw that back. The ideal of a meritocratic hierarchy encompassing the whole population is not attested in Chinese literature before Sang Jun Shu, and excavated texts leave no doubt that it was meticulously implemented. This was one of the most important social reforms in the journey from the Bronze Age to the Imperial Era. Moreover, the notion of imperial standards is widely attested in excavated sources, even if they do not always use the keyword fa. One common word is cheng. Uh, quota, performance norms, which facilitated the calculation of anticipated receipts and expenditures. Administrators undoubtedly grasped the practical value of such devices, regardless of their degree of familiarity with philosophical texts. Some scholars have argued that collective punishment also bespeaks legalist influence, but this case is harder to prove. There are different kinds of collective punishment in legal sources, including lian zuo, which I call linked responsibility. As we've seen a man's household defined as those who dwelled with him, uh, as well, uh, including his servitors, would be concomitantly punished if he committed a crime. This is not a prominent idea in Shang Jun Shu or Han Feizi. What is more likely is that one specific instrument of collective punishment, namely the group of five, that's you, uh, who would be held responsible for one another's conduct derives from Lord Shang. The very word Wu, which means five-man squad, discloses the military origins of such techniques of control. Collective punishment, it should be noted, was not a conceptual innovation. Rather, its expansion in the Warring States period was the product of institutional refinement. The archaeological record suggests collective punishment in the Bronze Age. The doctrine of heaven's mandate, Tianming which held that the Shang populace was conquered because of the misdeeds of its wicked king, implicitly incorporates an acceptance of collective punishment. The idea that an entire polity could be punished or corrected by invaders seems to go back even earlier to the Shang dynasty itself. Lastly, readers will have noticed that the above excerpts from Shang Jinshu and Han Feizi scarcely refer to real laws and never quote them. Thus, they offer little insight into another important element of the transition to empire, household registration. As the excavated documents from Li Ye make clear, properly documenting every subject, his or her legal status, domicile, and so on, was regarded as crucial to the survival of the regime. The far-sighted minister Xiao He recognized the significance of such registers when, during the chaos of the collapse of the Qin, he decided to forego looting in order to secure them for the benefit of the new Han Empire. He well understood that governing the realm would be easier with these documents in hand and perhaps impossible without them. He did not have much use for Han Fei. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Golden, for the very illuminating talk. Uh, recently, I also think about the TME mandate of heaven, right? For our conventional understanding, that is the most you know, important moral discourse to explain the rise and the fall of a dynasty. But is that discourse just have justice inside? How could you punish the innocent commoners when the politicians or the lunars commit crimes, right? So uh, I think Professor Ando would present totally different pictures about the legal philosophy and the legal practice in the Rome Empire. So Professor Ando, it's your turn. Yeah, if you don't need to uh, share PowerPoint, right? Uh, actually, I maybe I'll in 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 light of what Professor Golden did, I'll, I'll just show two things quickly. Um, uh, let me see to share screen. Yeah, so I think for yeah, no, I, I can share screen. Um, so the first thing I'll do is uh, just I'll, I'll put up a map. Um, oh, that's not. I mean, there's yeah. a different. There's a different one I wanted to show first. Hmm. Stop that share. 
Uh, I thought I had, ah, here we go. No, uh, for some reason, oh, there we go, here. Um, sorry, I have too many files open on the desktop at the same time. I think it was actually showing the right one and I just couldn't see it myself. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do um, very quickly, th this is a map of the Roman Empire at something like its height, except of course in the very, very slow and incremental set of changes that the empire underwent from, let us say, the year 30 BCE to the year 400 CE, there were actually several peaks and several diminishments. I mean, every now and then, some crazy new emperor would try to decide that they, you know, that the glory of his reign depended on marching north of the Danube or marching into Arabia and would temporarily con conquer something and then, and then lose it again. But this at least gives you an idea of the extent of the empire at its height. And um, about that, I want to say one sort of general point, which will, which I think impinges on or inflects or shapes the kind of Roman practice, or you might even say it establishes the kind of conditions of possibility of Roman legal practice, at least at the start. Um, and that is to say that the the Roman Empire was not only larger than most other pre-modern empires. Um, if it was a country today, it would be something like the seventh largest country in the world. But it was by far the most ecologically diverse. Um, so that, you know, it included everything from the swamps in the northern reaches of the Rhine to southern stretches of Scotland to the Judean desert east of the Dead Sea, to the mountains of Cappadocia, and around to the Atlantic coast of Morocco. Um, and by way of judging something like, we might say, the artificiality of the Roman Empire, it's, you know, it's perhaps worth pointing out that despite, you know, long periods of imperial rule, both before Rome and after Rome, and many, many aspirations, to empire in Europe and empire in the Mediterranean, no other historical formation has come remotely close. None is, you know, there's been no power that held merely the European portion of the Roman Empire, let alone the parts in the Balkans and North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and in, in, you know, the, whatever one might say about, you know, the, the, the size of some Mesoamerican empires or the kind of particular configuration of territories held by one or another instantiation of Chinese empire, they are, they are geographically at least, and in all sorts of other ways, um, legacies of one another. And that's even true of some Mesopotamian empires in the second millennium BC, but that's not true of Rome. And that presented the, the ecological and cultural diversity and one might add the very, very substantial challenges of, um, of communication in the Roman Empire presented a variety of challenges to government um, with the result that you know, Rome was one of those empires. It's not uniquely, it's, it's not a universal feature of pre-modern empire, obviously, um, give, um, but um, Rome, Rome was one of those pre-modern empires uh, that you might say, governed through the management and cultivation of diversity. Um, in part because it could do very little else. Now, there is a moment of transition which I'll come to, which I'll, which I'll describe in a second, but um, let me then switch. I have to stop sharing that document and then switch to this. Uh, so um, if one had then to present a kind of single text of something like Roman legal theory um, that captured, uh, you know, that, that, that captured how the Romans approached something like um, these immense number of units of rule. I'll say just a word after this about what those were, but um, it would be, 
something like the opening lines in Gaius's Institutes, a second century CE textbook of Roman private law, which however opens with just three or four paragraphs on the kind of public law context in which Roman private law developed. And the sentence I want to focus on is um, this one here. Uh, the law that each people establishes for itself is peculiar to it and is called jus kiwile, being as it were the special law of that kiwitas. Now, kiwitas is a Latin term that essentially means um, citizen body, but by metonymy, it also means the city state in which that people lived. The term people here, which translates, oh, dear, dear. The term people, which translates um, Latin populus, is a technical term that also means citizen body. Um, in that sense, it, it, it doesn't have an obvious correlate, say, in Greek, but it means the citizen body. And the, the, the most important terms otherwise in this text, I mean, those are merely terms of art, are what you might call the distributive each and the reflexive proprietorial, proprietorial for itself. N now we have from the Roman Empire uh, at one particular moment in time, around the late 60s CE, a list of the peoples of the empire who were recognized as autonomous city-states. Uh, there were approximately 2,000 of them. Um, as a further matter, the, list, the same list includes the names of many villages, um, sometimes dozens of villages that were administratively subordinated to these city-states. That is, there were many population centers, many towns, many things that we might call cities um, that were that existed in the Roman Empire that were not allowed to use their own laws. This, this the status of these 2000 city states that was called a people or a kibitas was a privileged position. Um, and it wasn't necessarily one you held before Rome. It was a, it was an ascribed status. The empire recognized it and the empire could and did sometimes take it away to punish a people. That said, my point is simply that when this textbook says each city-state establishes a private law for itself, in potentiality, Rome was saying that the political territory of the empire embraced 2,000 separate systems of private law, in potentiality. We actually don't know, you know, there are many of these, many, many of these micro-communities whose private law we know very little about. There are undoubtedly some number who are classified as essentially Roman municipalities, which may have used a version of Roman private law. Here, I'm just talking about the, the, the theory um, that Rome insisted um, that each one of these uh, city-states should use its own law. Now, hmm, okay. Let me stop sharing. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just describe I'll, I'll just describe some ramifications of this position and then and then and then and then and then stop. Um, so uh, the, 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 the consequence of this was, I mean, I, I suppose I should say a further matter about the about how this translates into practice, and then I'll talk specifically about legal practice. Um, the uh, neither Greek nor Latin, and of course many other languages were spoken in the Mediterranean, but we haven't got a good uh, accounting of its um, of their, as it were, their something like political subjectivities. We simply don't have enough literary remains from anyone other than uh, the Judeans to say anything with certainty. So we have many, 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 many thousands of words of Punic, but they're almost entirely epigraphic and they're almost all private tombstones from the period of the Roman Empire. And we have many, many Celtiberian documents. So about 30 different languages are represented in the remains of the ancient Mediterranean, um, some even non-Indo-European languages, uh, but um, in none of them do we have anything like an accounting of their, as it were, either political or subjectival reactions to, to Roman Empire, um, except, as they say, in Hebrew and, uh, and, in, and in Greek. Um, 
But neither Greek nor Latin, to use the most to, to, to speak of the most widely used languages of the ancient Mediterranean, had a unitary concept of sovereignty. Um, both of them distinguished in their vocabulary between what we might think of as freedom of action in foreign affairs, which in Greek they called eleutheria, or in Latin you called libertas, um, and uh, the right to use one's own laws, which the Greeks called autonomia, from which we get autonomy, and in Latin expressed this by periphrasis, um, the, 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 to literally to use one's own laws. Um, and I mentioned this because in the gradual kind of extended process by which subject peoples were incorporated into the empire, um, Rome often turn, turned around. We have some documentary evidence that something like exactly in the moment of conquest, the Romans would, uh, I'll be theatrical and use a prop, Actually, they were very small. The, 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 the best surviving example is about is the size of this book. The, the Roman general, having conquered a population, would take out a piece of bronze and inscribe a note on it saying, um, usually with a list, the to, you know, to the people of Notre Dame, Indiana, um, the laws, land, buildings, sacred properties, rituals, and so on and so on. And there'll be a long list that you had on the day before conquest, you are to have and keep thereafter for so long as the Roman Senate and people shall wish. They, they conquer them and then just say, as you were. Um, now, of course, in a kind of Hobbesian way, they say that you do it as, as Hobbes describes on, in, in the chapter on sovereignty by acquisition, you have all these things on sufferance of Rome but you simply go back to using exactly the same legal system that you had before. Now, I mentioned what I said about sovereignty because it's important to understand that um, the fact that somebody came along and said, you are no longer free to have your own foreign affairs was, <clears throat> I mean, I hate to say, but just frankly, not a big deal. Um, we know of no region of the ancient Mediterranean at no time was there, I mean, there, there was just, never a moment in which someone in the ancient world was not potentially subject to political domination by someone else. Um, in that sense, um, all, although we have some ancient Roman legal theorists who said that slavery did not exist in natural law, um, when the Romans wrote catalogs of the observable customs of the world, and as I say, the Romans thought that the empire was composed of 2000 separate legal systems, the, the Romans said, we know of no society on the planet Earth that doesn't have slavery. The fact that it was against natural law notwithstanding. And similarly, I mean, I, I don't want to say that imperial violence was a, is, a, is, a, is um, um, particularly say today, I wouldn't say that imperial violence is a neutral thing. That said, um, no one in the ancient world protests against empire as a concept. They, wish, they just wish they had an empire. Um, so this grant of the right to use your own laws produces a kind of set of documents. We have literally dozens and dozens and dozens of records of essentially memoranda that went from localities to Rome and back again. Every time there was a new emperor, the people of Notre Dame would appoint somebody as an ambassador who would go to the new emperor Golden in Philadelphia and thank him and congratulate him on his ascending to the throne of the world and ask him to confirm their historic privileges, in particular, the right to use their own private law. We have no record. I mean, no one would preserve on stone or bronze a negative reply, but we know of no negative reply. In every case, um, they would give him some sort of local gift and the, the ceremony required that he accept the gift and confirm privileges. And in a kind of several notable cases, right, uh, they announce things like in, in one famous document that people say, we, the philo Romaios and, uh, and philo Kaiseros people of Lycia do the following, right? Which means we, the Rome-loving and Caesar-loving people of Lycia. That is to say, there's an economy here, an economy of exchange, in which the, the grant of the right to use one's own civil law produces a kind of imperial quiescence. That's just as good as you were going to get and people were glad to have it. So that about something like the theory, um, 
everybody should have their own laws. It's a deliberately pluralist regime. It's deliberately pluralist because it produces a particular kind of social order. And I take it that it's somehow motivated by the fact that the Romans could do nothing else. There was no possibility of actually teaching all 50 million people what Roman law was or telling them to change their marriage customs. So um, then I'll, I'll just say a quick word about the, the legal documentation and about where it sort of points and then I'll stop. Um, we then have, absent a small number of kind of uh, uh, statutes of the Roman of the Roman state, of which we have about fifty or sixty, and I, I, I'm actually currently have an NEH project with, um, and I've recruited about twenty collaborators to produce a new edition and translation of all surviving Roman statutes. But um, bracketing this, the the kind of evidence of law that we have from the Roman world essentially derives is of two kinds, and also has a specific geography. Um, basically, we have a large number of pieces of something like academic legal writing by the people we now call the Roman jurists. Um, wherever they were born, the overwhelming bulk of them, possibly excluding this guy Gaius who wrote this textbook, um, uh, uh, the overwhelming majority of them clearly worked in the city of Rome, in the metropole, at the capital of the empire. And we have surviving about something like almost exactly 300,000 words of excerpts from their theoretical writings on law. Um, by the same method of transmission, we have excerpts of uh, imperial edicts, which start to survive in bulk only in the second century CE. Um, but in essence, we have a, a body of material written in written in, in extensive discursive texts and subject to a literary transmission by copying and recopying across generations from the capital. And then just to return, just to point out the kind of distance, we also have primarily from Egypt down here, but also a small number from the Syrian desert here um, of documents on papyrus, um, uh, ephemeral documents from something like personal archives and occasionally from administration, judicial petitions filed by individuals, sometimes with records of their place in an official archive. Um, so evidence of something like the practice of law in individual cases, almost entirely from Egypt in sheer, sheer bulk, some uh, from the Judean desert where these documents survive on these perishable media because of the uh, the, very, the extraordinarily dry conditions under which they survive. We have a tiny number of documents on pieces of wood, which was another kind of ephemeral writing material. Um, sometimes they wrote directly on, they, they painted boards white and wrote on the white paint. And sometimes they scraped out a shallow space in the wood and put wax in there and scratched in the wood wax. We have a small number of these from central Italy, a small number from the Danube, and we have a surprising number of wooden documents from two places in England. One, a former Roman fort along Hadrian's Wall. Um, up, um, I don't know if you can see the cursor. Right, Hadrian's Wall in Scotland. And actually a small number of wooden documents that were found in the soil in which they were digging the European headquarters for Bloomberg. Um, there's an awful lot of Roman remains in, in the UK. In, well, actually, basically England, not, not Wales or Scotland or Ireland. Um, um, there's a surprising amount of surviving there, and it turns up in it turns up as it does everywhere else in the world um, during construction projects. So the new Bloomberg headquarters dug particularly deep and came up with all sorts of wooden documents. And a fantastic amount of archaeological remains is being discovered as they're building this crazy new train system in um, the HS2, whatever they call it, in the UK. Um, and I'll just finish by saying that for a very, very, very long time. The tradition of legal study differentiated strongly um, between something like Roman law proper, um, which we studied via essentially doctrinal means. We studied rules and evolution, evolution in rules in the academic writings of the metropole. And uh, we looked askance, I'll use a prop again. We, we put on glasses and looked with disdain at, the, uh, at these kind of funny little documents 
by people often with Greek or Semitic names, often the provinces, who clearly are using a debased uh, form of law. And as the documentation has built up and people have looked at it with, um, I think, more generous eyes, it turns out, I think, that, um, you know, various kinds of things are now coming to be visible if you read sympathetically in this documentation. For example, as, as you well might expect, as you try and apply rules to a culturally and ecologically diverse landscape, um, it turns out that uh, all sorts of forms of, for instance, analogical reasoning are now visible in these texts. So when they do have to apply a Roman rule, despite being, in a, as it were, a foreign landscape, um, I don't know, um, there was a Roman rule about what to do with um, firewood um, when you left a property or, or so, when you transferred property, either via succession or via sale. Um, and uh, the Roman had a conventional understanding of one, the sorts of things you used as firewood, which were therefore designated by the term lignus, wood. And uh, there's a hilarious set of reactions, both in the documentary evidence and in Roman writing, on what happens when you encounter, I mean, the, the outlier case <clears throat> was people who burnt dried cow dung um, as for firewood. And the question was raised by Romans. And in fact, in one case in the provinces, um, could, if you burned it to make heat, could anything you burn to make heat be classified as lignus? And would it then be ju judged by the law of lignus when you left a property to someone else? Um, and I, I don't want to, as it were, be a, a kind of nutty positivist about what to do about, uh, about as it were, um, um, essentially accidental patterns of survival, I will simply observe that I, th I think it now turns out to be true that some of these most characteristic forms of legal reasoning that we know from the Roman jurists dwelling in the capital are chronologically first visible to us in these crazy documents trying to apply Roman rules to provinces. Now, I don't mean that they analogical reasoning of various forms and the use of legal fictions and so on first developed um, uh, I don't know, in the Roman province of Egypt, I, I simply observe that the, the long-term trend over, say, something like the last 40 or 50 years in, um, in legal history in the empire is to bring these separate domains of geographically and culturally distant practice at the very margins of the empire and, le and doctrinal study at the center, that these two fields are very, very gradually coming to inform one another in a, in a new way. And I suspect that, I mean, I, I, I could itemize some things and I gave a few things obviously in the readings. I think a quite new and interesting form of legal history in the context of empire or in the context of European empire at least is emerging in, in consequence of this. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Ando for your fantastic talk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, give us some idea, empire could exist in different format, right? Mm -hmm. Not chain, unified empire with, mm -hmm. you know, one very strict legal statutes mm -hmm. reach out to a remote village, you know, a thousand miles away from the capital. So I think it's time for Professor Kiley to offer your uh, comments. So I really appreciate, you know, modern legalists could, you know, really, Ponder upon the ancient history, but as a modern, you know, I still modern person, even so. I really feel, you know, ancient history have its significance to modern discourse. Uh, it's your turn, uh, Professor Kelly. Wow, well, thank you very much. This is an extraordinary event. I, I've never been to anything like this, so so thank you so much for having me, and uh, it's a pleasure. I've uh, I realize how much a trouble you went to uh, Professor Tsai on arranging this and the Notre Dame staff and HKBU and so forth, uh, putting this together and to get some uh, wonderful uh, leaders in their fields like Professor Golden and Professor Endo together uh, to come together and show us uh, in the broadest uh, way that uh, we're thinking about these um, tremendous empires and, and ranges of lands and, and peoples in early times. Uh, which I have to tell you, I, I, 
I love this stuff when I was much younger. And so it's great to catch up with it. And I loved exploring sites in both countries and in different parts of the Roman Empire, especially in England and, uh, and Italy. Uh, and, uh, and of course, in China, uh, finding what's left, if you can, uh, in different places. But I'm uh, very out of touch with it. I'm in no position. I can only say I would, I would imagine the whole audience would wonder what we can't really think of Julius Caesar and Qin Shi Huang speaking to each other, but they're not in the same period. <laughs> but it's almost impossible to consider them uh, agreeing <laughs> on much from the discussion I think we've just heard, but maybe I'll be proven wrong. I'd be happy to, uh, to be so. Uh, so I was really thinking about why I'm here <laughs> in all of this. And, uh, and, and Professor Tsai, this is, this is really your, your fault, though. It, it's, a, it's a great honor. So, you know, I, I'm filled with very simplistic questions, very basic questions. And, and I think maybe that's uh, one of the reasons you invited me, <laughs> is to ask, ask those. Uh, because uh, among those simple questions are, are what are we comparing? And, uh, and what are the grounds of that comparison? And is this about what is commensurate or not? Are there issues that are not commensurate that are much more interesting, perhaps? That's part of what I'm hearing right now, perhaps. Uh, you know, but I even have questions just from the, you know, I, I, I hate to be the person representing uh, um, modern uh, Chinese legal history. I, I'm, a, I'm a so, sort of a complex outlier even to that field. And there are other people on this call that can speak better to it. Uh, but uh, legal history here seems to have a, a very close attachment to, to specifically to the, the centrality of code as opposed to the centrality of justice uh, or other possible interpretations that you could develop. And in modern times, uh, thinking about all the ways in which uh, code may be present, but other things matter uh, is part of the story. But maybe I'll come back to that in, in a minute. But I think there's another aspect, uh, maybe very fundamental question, which is always with us in the modern, which is why East and West, why China is as East, why the West as particular forms of Europe or even Rome as, as the West. And I think Professor Tai knows that for my field or for the field I'm representing here, uh, we can't get away from this. It's unavoidable. <laughs> you know, uh, there's no escaping it. Uh, modern Chinese legal history was, continues to be constructed in the uneven grappling of the West, whatever that means, it's quite specific in its 19th century origins and China or the Qing Empire, uh, right from the mainly, uh, um, you know, tremendously 19th century Orientalist studies that directly reinforced initial British and European imperialism through defining Chinese penal law in a way that now we don't accept at all, uh, to the subsequent early 20th century self-orientalization in the creation of the, the reform process of law in modern China, uh, which uh, is a process carried on almost entirely by Chinese people uh, in rejection of their own tradition. And uh, two, subsequently, a, a period of tremendous fruition at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century of legal history developments in the study of modern Chinese late imperial and modern Chinese history, uh, which uh, was obsessed with dismantling Max Weber uh, above all and, and, and notions of rationalization that were central to a, a, a concept of, of, of the problem of Chinese law and why uh, uh, this had to be taken apart. And of course, uh, the greatest limitation of that finally demonstrated uh, Philip C. C. Huang, who's so famous in this field, uh, determining in his recent years working in China after so many years training people at UCLA and the UCLA school, uh, that for all those efforts in modern Chinese legal history, uh, that uh, Weberian modernism was dominant in China <laughs> and still more now than ever, even the China that we're always taking to task in the West uh, for not having human rights and so forth, uh, that that uh, 
Weberian type of modernism in legal scholarship and legal history uh, remains uh, dominant. Uh, the, the upshot is that for modern Chinese legal history, uh, we are constantly struggling simply with some of the language, even some of the language used right now today <laughs> in the discussion of early China. We're always wondering in English and in Chinese about uh, our words, our categories of analysis, uh, our latent assumptions, our blind spots built into how we know, how we understand, how we think, the scope of our endeavors, uh, not to mention uh, the grounds of our debates. Uh, now, I don't know how useful this is to this particular conversation, but I can just say from my perspective listening to it, this is something uh, we have worked on a lot in the more modern periods. And I can say that I wonder when we are undertaking any kind of legal history, uh, how we think about that legal history being something that can be both about uh, the kind of governance and social order matters that we've mostly heard about and uh, political adjustment types of uh, arrangements and, and, and issues of justice itself and the, and the debates on what uh, justice is in a society. Uh, what are the boundaries to our legal history? Uh, when we recognize how much its concerns and questions have to do with all kinds of other things, uh, with moralities, with rights, rituals. And I'm talking here about the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. Uh, moralities, rights, rituals of humans being with powerful spirits, gods, unseen forces, and even at the same time still pursuing pragmatic uh, strategies relating to economics and all sorts of other things as individuals, as communities, and asserting and acting upon powerful emotions arising within always diverse and unequal social identities, roles, and social relations, as we've heard a lot about uh, today as well, uh, which is something that doesn't go away in modern times uh, at all. Uh, how do we, and I'll slightly uh, misquote Chatterjee here, take into account the inability of the normative regime of law to fully bring under its uh, order the real heterogeneity of power relations in society. So uh, this is not a set of questions that are uh, that leave out the question of sources that has been discussed about today. As a historian, we all are interested in sources. And I think many on this call would be aware that for people just in the Chinese history field, uh, probably 95% of all available extant sources that we could imagine using uh, exist for the period from the end of the 19th century through the 20th century uh, relative to every other period. It's just an absolute embarrassment of riches uh, when you think about possible sources relative to other periods. And yet, those who work in this period uh, face many of the exact types of concerns uh, on the uh, empirical quest that have just been discussed. Uh, that, that does not uh, disappear. Uh, those same holes, those uh, same warpings, those same confusions uh, still exist. There's still a top heavy element to code, uh, literary theory, legal philosophy, elite representations, and so forth. And what's always hardest to find and hardest to work with uh, is, of course, that uh, legal practice in, in action. Now, of course, the UCLA school, the history of practice school, has made tremendous progress on this in the last couple of decades, three or four decades, uh, mainly working with archival cases um, and um, also trying to move beyond those archival cases. But I think anybody who's familiar with that body of work would still, including many of the people involved in that project, I would realize the limitations of it as well, that it has not brought us close enough uh, to the uh, hoped for often sense of a kind of fullness or complexity to the social life of law and justice, as we might hope. Uh, one frontier to this, I'm, maybe this is the reason Professor Tsai invited me, I, I'm very interested in, in tremendous local specific specificity, uh, micro history, which of course, uh, the, the critiques of this are long standing, but it is one uh, way to try to uh, put things together in uh, very complex puzzles. Uh, I won't speak about them now, but it's certainly uh, studying it at that level uh, 
uh, demonstrates that there is code. Uh, there are other things that relate to code. And uh, there are all sorts of different practices and theories. But if you want to see how things uh, work in the complexity of the places, Professor Ando just talked about the kind of marginal areas of the uh, the empire, I think that's an area of great interest right now within modern China is, is digging down into areas uh, in in uh, the provincial areas, local areas, and and seeing how things uh, were functioning in in those places. So um, I don't mean to sound uh, pessimistic. I think uh, what we've heard is wonderful for the early period. I think if uh, Professor Golden is worried about students taking on the, the tasks of, of new materials, people should should rise to it. It sounds fantastic. And these, these challenges, uh, even the ones I'm talking about here, are what, what makes it all worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's what we're doing. And, and it's a great century that we're in for the study of, of modern history, as it sounds like it is for the early period as well. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Try to you know make some bridges between the really two thousand years ago, you know, history in the east and the west and the modern practice in China. So I think right now we have about thirty to forty minutes devoted to all the panelists, Professor Golden, Professor Ando, and Professor Kylie. I probably will also have many questions. Want to you know listen to your comments? I hope this you know would facilitate some conversation. So, you know, how about we will have a free conversation, you know, each of us might, you know, have some questions for, you know, participants, you know, for all the panelists. Go ahead, Professor Golden, please. Um, I have a question for Professor Ando, and um, it's uh, a, a reflection of my ignorance of the Roman Empire. Um, so if different populations within the empire are being granted a traditional privilege of um, using their own laws, administratively speaking, what does it mean to be part of the Roman Empire? Is it that you're taxed? Is it merely that you recognize the suzerainty of the Roman Empire Emperor? Um, how, and I, I assume in the long history of Rome, there's different answers to these questions, but um, what do you have to do to, to, be, to be part of Rome? Yeah, um, I, I suppose, a, a, I mean, a, a, a great question and one that's, um, it very, whose answer does change and which is in some periods very difficult to answer. Um, uh, as a matter of something like the history of law, um, and more broadly speaking, at least a kind of, if you, depending on how processualist you want to be, um, the uh, uh, something like the history of uh, status and possibly subjectivity. Of course, the the Roman Empire transformed itself over time, first by the gradual extension of Roman citizenship to select members of something like subject populations. And ultimately in a kind of very interesting transformative moment, the Romans extended Roman citizenship to all freeborn residents of the Roman empire. Um, and in the long history of something like empires with which I'm familiar, this is a kind of interesting transformation, right? It had a, in, in two respects, first of all, as a purely matter of influence, this shaped what you might call the project of empire um, in Europe ever after. Um, virtually any meaningful European empire, wherever it happened to operate thereafter, had to claim because of Rome, that one of its objects was to kind of, you know, change the culture, do this. I mean, they had to have an imperial project. And the part of the imperial project was a claim that what they would ultimately do, so as soon as the subject populations were ready for it, was um, establish legal, legal equality or equality of right um, uh, among all persons within the imperial space. 
Um, now, as anyone who knows anything about the 20th century could observe, um, and you could even go back into the 19th century, say the, the quarrels that arose in the Spanish empire for which the constitution of Cadiz was supposed to be a kind of response but failed. Um, uh, at various moments in the long history of subsequent European empire, subject populations would, you know, knock on the door and say, hi, I've now been to Oxford and, you know, we all, we all drink tea, could we now be free? And um, at every single moment that this sort of uh, conversation took place, the European empire collapsed, but did not in the Roman case, right? Um, so there, there was a moment when Rome simply transformed everyone legally into Romans with a variety of sort of complicated consequences. Nomenclature, rules of succession changed, and there's some reason to think that it, whereas Rome lacked the ability to make these transformations at the moment of conquest, by the third century CE, they, they did actually affect a very substantial change. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, um, which is a much more complicated history to tell, is, is that, um, uh, you know, there's a there's a kind of aesthetics to power, right? There, you know, power has power elicits certain kinds of affective response based in part on people's aesthetic estimation of it. And there's an extraordinary convergence of, and our, our evidence here is, of course, um, primarily material. There's an, uh, but some textual, there's an extraordinary convergence of something like the material culture of the provinces of the empire um, around a set of central Mediterranean norms, right? You, well before citizenship is extended, the local elites who dwelled in these 2000 city states um, began using something like Roman architectural forms. They built buildings to hold Roman style public entertainments. Um, uh, in the West, um, Roman style dinnerware is very rapidly found. I mean, they just began using Roman style plates, something like dinnerware, like everywhere. Um, there's just an extraordinary transformation in the material culture of something like elite uh, lifestyle in something like fractal relation. Um, we have a lot of, I mean, I could be very curious to know what sort of private documents are preserved on permanent media in China of your period, but we have on the order of, I mean, the one document most private people would put on stone is exactly what you would put on stone in the United States, which is a tombstone. So as a matter of private documentation, we have you know, in excess of 1 million tombstones from the Roman world. Um, and uh, one of the things you, that people have done is go into specific regions and study changes in nomenclature and try to um, date these out. And with names, actually the other, the other, the other thing for which we, thing like those for the, the other cultural phenomenon for which we have this kind of evidence because you can often they often say things about the religious affiliation on a tombstone is religion right and if you ask yourself how do religions spread well the cult of isis or the cult of christ or all of these new spready type religions um they appear first in the port cities of the mediterranean because ships travel faster than than people do over land and then they appear upriver. They travel along with goods. They travel upriver by cabotage. And then they travel to inland cities that are connected by paved roads. And they show up last in villages that are connected by dirt roads. You say the same thing about nicknames. We have enough tombstones that you can say something meaningful. As you could, I mean, I don't know if anyone here ever, you can go to the, there are various websites that extract naming data from the US census. And you can say, ah, oh, you know, Leong was a very popular name in 2018, or Cliff was an exceedingly popular name, and Cliff was number 13 in 1992, or something like this. Um, you can say something about the popularity of nicknames, and um, there are a whole set of nicknames which appear first in the Italian region of Campania, which is to say around Rome, 
and which you then find about a generation later. And you wouldn't even thought this, I mean, in the absence of TV or movies, how do these things spread? But you then find these names in juridically, in cities that are constituted as juridically as Roman colonies on the coast. And then you find them upland and so on. Um, so I, I, exactly how to cash out a claim. What does this mean to be in the Roman empires? That is how they felt about it is often hard to say, right? Um, and there are a whole body of modern theories that you might deploy. And you know, I have worked with a bunch of this stuff to, to ask ourselves how, what interpretively should we say about the meaning of these patterns? Um, but I can certainly offer you a purely empirical claim that well before the universalization of citizenship, there was a profound influence on a variety of kind of the practices of daily life, even down to personal names, um, spread outwards from the capital um, and change the kind of practices of an, a very, very wide ranging set of populations. Thank you. Actually, I will follow Professor Golden's question. In terms of uh, this kind of, you know, locally provinces, they have their respective legal system, then you have Rome legal system. But is that possible that, you know, the locals, you know, the people in the provinces would say, hey, you know, I feel the Rome legal system have more justice. You know, I don't want to be applied, be judged by the magistrate locally. I will go to the central court. I talk about this because in China, you know, you have different hierarchy system, right? If the local mayor or magistrate could not, you know, have doubts about legal case, what they have to do is report to the you know, provincial level, then provincial level would report the, you know, cases, legal cases with doubts to the central government. I just wondering in this kind of, you know, Rome empire, do you have a hierarchy system at least in people's mindset, you know, some legal system is, you know, better, far better in terms of justice. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I, I'll, I'll offer an answer as hard as I can. Um, and I, 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 if, if, if Professor Golden has anything to say as a comparative matter, I'd be interested. So, um, as the as the language of that guy Gaius suggests when he says each kiwatas has its own law, right? Um, it's actually hard to cash out looking at that, whether it amounts to a kind of, uh, uh, whether what he's talking about is a, you know, a principle of personality or a principle of territoriality, because at some level, of course, one of the funny things about the term kiwitas is it's an abstraction from kiwis. It, its literal meaning is citizenship. Um, and it's by metonymy that it means citizen body and for that matter, city state, because there was an assumption not unreasonable, um, that people, people would hold citizenship in the city, I mean, people would dwell in the city state in which they held citizenship. And that must have been true, you know, I, the scientific claim would be something like 99% of the time. There was not a huge amount of human mobility at that level in intro. There was a significant body of law about resident aliens, but the, 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 the incidence, is, it, it's hard to judge, but it must have been small. Um, uh, by the time you get to a kind of uh, the, the period of these academic jurists, they would insist that something like um, they would insist that something like a lex fori, a rule of you know a, a, the 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 law of contract, for example, the the, the law you apply regarding contract uh, is the law of the place where the contract was signed, and they would they would simply insist on that and make questions of jurisdiction simple. Um, but if you look at that claim, right? There is nowhere in that very, in that single sentence of Gaius, he implies that these systems exist in parallel. No hierarchy is implied. Um, but um, it is, however, true um, uh, that the Roman governors of particular regions, to use the kind of language of people of professors of law and economics, Roman governors used to hold assize courts and travel in a circuit around their province and hold court on a regular schedule in various cities. They go to Springfield, Missouri, and then Kansas City, and then they come to Chicago, and then they go wherever, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, uh, in those contexts, right, there, 
the, 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 they would simply receive petitions to hear cases from anyone who is in the area. And um, we have among, among these pieces of papyrus, like they, they have document numbers. You could come up and deposit your petition with the court official. And in one case, on day three of the, of the governor's stay, we have petition number 1805. Um, now, much of the time they must have submitted solely in written documentation, because it would have been virtually impossible that of course he could hear, he wasn't hearing 600 cases a day. Um, uh, but um, um, to come back to your point, uh, it's very hard now to parse out the question whether, what, how many of these cases would have been cases in which the governor's court was the court of the first instance? There's certainly a large number of cases, but a percentage one can't say, in which the governor was hearing an appeal. Somebody lost or didn't get the outcome exactly as they wanted at the local level, and they would ask the governor to hear it, and he would turn out, the Roman official would effectively function as a court of the second instance. Um, and at that point, a variety of questions arose about, for example, what law the Roman governor would apply. He was in, we have statements of norms that the Roman governor would have to apply local law or should apply local law. But we also have texts in which they list cascading series of norms. If the place has written law, then you should apply their law. If they don't have written law, ask them if they have written documentation of decisions in prior similar cases, and then apply that rule. And if they haven't got that, then ask them if they have documentation of their customs. And if they haven't got that, apply the law of the city of Rome. Um, and in a variety of different ways, I think it looks like, I think it seems clear that the existence of a Roman court the, the coming into being of the practice, and it's not clear that the Romans intended this, the coming into being of a practice of Roman officials serving as courts of the second instance put pressure on the, at least the procedures and perhaps even what you might call the knowledge technologies of courts of the first instance, meaning local courts. That it, if you knew the Roman official was going to show up and say, well, where's your written law? What am I supposed to do with you people if you have no written law? I mean, there's lots of other modern comparative colonial evidence of the writing down, the most famous is the case of Hawaii, of the writing down of law in response to the arrival of an empire. And likewise, if, you know, there, there's, a, there's in specific kinds of criminal cases, the Romans would demand a transcript, a, a verbatim transcript of any interrogation of a criminal. Well, if the Romans said that, then you'd better find yourself a notary and you'd better develop a practice of, um, of transcribing interrogations of criminals and so on. So that the, the, on the one, this is a good, a, good, a, good, a good example, because on the one hand, there was a theory that all, all of these jurisdictions were separate and completely autonomous. But the practice, in particular, the practice of empire, by which the supervening power just provided a kind of court of the second instance had substantial effects on local legal practice, I think without any clear vision that this would take place. Thank you, that's really wonderful. Uh, that's remind me of our Professor Kylie talk about the centrality of mm. courts, right? You have written down, mm. you know, more than centrality of justice, right? Mm. It's not one is more of justice, but one, you know, you have documentation you could trace. Professor Kelly, do you have questions for Professor Golden and Professor Ando? Well, I'm just uh, wondering in the case of, uh, for instance, uh, where uh, perhaps ritual might have been uh, important to, to governments in any of these situations. Uh, in other words, uh, other types of codes that were functioning alongside, I mean, certainly in the uh, late imperial times in China, uh, that was uh, that was important, and um, and so I'm kind of curious about that. I have a few thoughts about that. Um, so one of the reasons why Chinese legal history is so interesting is that the codes give you 
um, a very, very narrow and incomplete view of the complexity of the legal culture. And when you get other kinds of legal sources, that's when you can start to uh, reconstruct a more interesting picture of um, you know, the true experience of dealing with the law. Amazingly, even at, 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 at low levels of society, people who otherwise never appear in, in, in legal sources will show up in some kind of, uh, uh, historical sources, excuse me, will show up in, in legal sources. Now, as for ritual, um, we uh, academically, I think, tend to make the mistake of selecting out sources that smell legal to us and calling those legal sources and ignoring all sorts of other stuff that would have been you know, connective tissue in its own time and, and, and place, um, but it, it, it doesn't smell the same way to us. An example, what I'm talking about would be the Shui tomb, where we have all of these uh, legal sources, that's great. And you know, there's a few comments we can make about them. How representative are they? Um, is is that? Uh, are what are we seeing there? Are we seeing the the central law as it's being locally applied? Or if we had a, a, um, analogous texts from all over the empire, would we get different? Would we get different um, um, sorts of sources that would tell us different things? But right alongside with them are the so-called day books, which are um, um, almanacs of divination. And it's very clear that the same official is using both. For one thing, they're both buried in his tomb. For another, the almanacs, um, I was just talking about this um, a couple of weeks ago at a conference in Florida. They, they often um, get into questions like, how do you catch a thief? Well, the magistrate is involved in catching a thief. And the, um, the, the prescriptions for catching a thief are not what we would call legalistic. On what day was the crime committed? Which creature of the zodiac does that correspond to? If it's rat day, then look for somebody who acts like a rat, somebody whose name has something to do with rat. Um, illegal historians usually don't study texts like that. And it's because um, it does, you know, it doesn't smell like legal history to us, as I was saying, and also it's proceeding um, according to a logic that doesn't seem the same as that of the of the of the legal sources that we sort of pick out and call uh, and call legal. But that's a mistake. The same, the same, you know, poor overworked uh, administrator is using both sorts of of sources and would 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 probably consider it weird that we consider one set legal and another set, you know, a divination at best and superstition uh, at, at, at worst. And it, it, it makes the situation more difficult, not less difficult for us to, um, to imagine. On the one hand, we have this legal system that is highly rational. There's, there's very rational concepts of, of of judicial procedure, um, what kinds of interrogations are permissible, what kinds aren't, uh, um, what's the right way, accounting is a serious issue for, for, this, um, for this legal culture. How do, you, how do you take account of assets, of, of debts, of obligations and so on? There's lots and lots of, of space that's devoted to how do you make an accurate accounting of something? Um, and then at the, at the same time that we have this, this, this legal culture that, that, that seems pretty rational, uh, the same administrator is catching thieves on the basis of whether the, uh, you know, whether the suspect looks like a, looks like a rat. Um, or or what, is, what is the administrator doing? How, to what extent is, is um, the, 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 the the poor overworked administrator who was buried in this tomb, to what extent is he relying on these texts at all? Are they truly representative of, you know, what his daily dispensation of justice uh, would have been? Or is that also a kind of representation and falsification um, because it, it, you know, it appears in a, in, in a context of a tomb? Who made the selection? Is this a selection of texts that he had on his desk when he dropped dead or is somebody else 
preparing these sources for his presentation to the other world, and in which case it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a sanitation or a, or a representation of who he really was. We, um, you know, the, it's, it's, the more sources we get, the more interesting questions we can ask, but it's not necessarily the case that the better answers we get. It seems to get weirder and weirder the more sources we have, not clearer and clearer. Thank you. Wonderful. Professor Ando, do you want to respond to the ritual you know, element in the goal practice? Um, it's in there. I was, I've been thinking about this very recently in, in connection with another, uh, a, a, a different issue, which is um, simply the, um, the, there are a number of Roman rituals uh, or a number of Roman actions, which the Romans described as imaginary or they use the Latin term imaginarius. Um, there's a term in common law, colorable. I, I think I've never encountered this outside of, uh, outside of law, which means something like um, uh, a legal action that has the correct form, but may well be counterfeit because you're doing it for with an intent other than the, the ritual is supposed to convey. Um, the, the, which is to say that the Romans were interested in not simply procedure, but as it were ritual aspects of procedure. There, there were crazy things that the Romans did that they thought of as archaic. I mean, I, I don't suppose I know, and I don't suppose, I don't, I don't actually even they knew whether some of these things were in fact archaic. Um, uh, they believed that there was a period early in Roman life when you sold things by weighing bits of metal on a scale. I mean, it's totally plausible, but I mean, I don't think I know, and I don't think they knew. Um, they had all sorts of funny theories about what an archaic version of themselves must have looked like. Um, and they, there was a form of transfer of a woman from one household to another for marriage, which took the form of um, of a sacrifice followed by a sale, and somebody had to stand there holding the scale up. And likewise, there were ways in which a, a, a father could release his son um, from the father's legal power by selling him to someone else um, and then buying them back and selling them again and buying them back and selling them again and so on. And um, uh, until there was a, I think it was three sales. If you sold your son three times, it was required and regarded as an abuse and he was set free. Or that was the Roman theory. And um, they occasionally make jokes about many of these forms um, that wouldn't it be a terrible shame if the father sold his son once at the start of this process of letting the son go and then just walked away. What would you do? Because um, the whole, everyone thought that you would sell a son because if you sold him then three times in the same afternoon, he would be released from your power and that could be a favor to the son. Um, but the father could sell his son once and then just walk away at which point his son was now someone else's slave. And that wouldn't be funny. Um, but they worried because th in these cases, they themselves were using a ritual. Um, they were using a ritual, as they understood it, designed for one end and using it to achieve some other, some other means. The, more importantly, I suppose, and that's been a preoccupation that's on like the last 36 hours, is the, at least their theory about this. Um, there is some evidence that the Romans would occasionally put on quite literally show trials. Um, uh, I, th I think I sent you a piece in which I described one or two of these, right? In which they would quite literally put on a show trial. They would go into a, some non-Roman space and for some reason or another would, you know, raise up a giant platform, um, send officials with the appropriate robes. Um, oh, I can actually show, some of these are actually very interesting. Um, first. And have to share to share the image, I have first to open the image, right? Uh, so this, oop, what just happened? No, uh, not this one. Well, I'll, I'll show this one too. Um, doink. Uh, oh, roll up. Here we go. So then I go um, zoom. Uh, I say shift. 
this is this is a silver cup. Um, I have a variety of pictures of um, of the sides of it, and I also have provided by the museum where the cup is held a digitally altered image that rolls it out so that you can see what it would look like if you spun the cup around. And um, this actually may even be the Emperor Augustus on a visit to Egypt. Um, but this is a Roman official wearing a Roman civilian garb, which is how you know he's functioning as a, uh, a judge, um, uh, sitting on uh, what's not a very good Roman chair but elevated. We have about 12 or 13 images of Roman, Roman trial scenes. And the, 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 the judge always sits on a raised platform. Um, and this one is often, there's a joke. There's another Roman image like this from Pompeii, uh, like 2000 kilometers away. Uh, we have another image where there's a, somebody screaming that might be a litigant and they're potentially chopping like a baby in half or something like this. And, and the other one in the wall drawing from Pompeii, it really does look like they're about to chop, chop the baby in half. And so they're also, they're, they're likened to, of course, the, the judgment of Solomon. All I will say about this is it's found in ancient Nubia. It's found in Ethiopia. How it got there, we don't know. But this is a Roman trial. This is, this is probably our best preserved depiction of a Roman trial. And it's found outside the borders of the empire. Um, and we also have a description of how did, how did everyone know that the emperor Trajan had conquered Arabia? And as I've tried to insist, and I think it's correct. I'm not sure that it's terribly interesting, but um, the, Roman, the Roman announcement that an area was pacified and now part of the empire was essentially a unilateral act. After all, these were highly fragmented places composed, as I say, of thousands of these stupid little city-states. And I, I just think that, that often enough, it very much looks like the Romans did not bother wandering around telling everyone, you're now part of the Roman empire. They declared an area pacified. Some people didn't get the message and kept on fighting. And the Romans then shift the language. If, if you fight Roman conquest before peace, that's a political act and you're like a warrior or an army. But if you keep fighting after the Romans unilaterally declare peace, then you're displaying kind of moral turpitude and you're, you're being disobedient and the, it earns a completely different discourse and punishment. But um, there's a kind of description of the emperor Trajan, more or less, announcing that the following battle in Arabia had been his last. And Arabia was now conquered. And he went and took a bath and washed the dust off himself. And he took off his metal breastplate and he put on a toga, returned to the field of battle, had people pile up sod, put a chair on top and began to hear legal disputes. I mean, I don't know who brought him these disputes, um, but it was very much in, in the Roman mind that, um, I mean, that a difference between what they would call, they, they had these uh, kind of uh, 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 polarity, militiae domi, meaning essentially military life and civilian life. And in this case, the transition from military life, i.e. The, the period of conquest, there is an exact moment in time when the Roman administration passed from a conquest phase to an administration phase. And you knew that because he took a bath and he began hearing trials. And, I, and I, I take it that that was, a, that was a display probably for his own army, but there may have been other people who were intended to see this. Um, I don't, he may even have, they, they may even have found people to bring him a dispute for him to settle um, uh, by way of, you know, uh, you know, making the whole thing look real. But, um, but that, that would be an example of, of the kind of use of, the, of legal ritual to make a claim, a political claim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this roundtable is just the beginning of the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we should devote time to our audiences. Mm -hmm. So before I you know, ask people to post questions, I would like to say uh, thank you so much for fantastic talks by Professor Golden and Professor Ando and Professor Kaini. Also, Professor Golden and Professor Ando provide all you know, reading list mm -hmm. we post on the website. So I said it's a very beginning. So we want to use this round table to trigger 
some momentum into their comparative studies. Also, Professor Golden have a fantastic bibliography on ancient China in the Western language. It's one of the best bibliography I could ever think of. So please uh, take advantage of all those expertise offered by our scholars. So right now, I think we will devote it to the audiences for their uh, for your questions. Uh, how about this? Uh, you could raise your hand and you know introduce yourself and then talk you know elaborate your question to make sure your question are limited to 30 seconds to one minute don't don't go beyond one minute thank you or if you are students got a little bit scared uh, you could type your question on the chart but i do encourage you to talk talk loudly Okay, go ahead, Professor Bai Tongdong. Can we see you? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, so actually, I have uh, uh, three questions. Uh, two for Professor Golden and one prof uh, for Professor Ando. Oh, by the way, uh, my name is Bai Tongdong. Uh, we're uh, in Chinese order. Tongdong Bai. Bai is my family name. Uh, I'm a professor of philosophy at Fudan University in Shanghai. And uh, uh, so for for Paul. Uh, I think I, I raised a similar question to you uh, in a different occasion before. Um, I mean, two. Uh, first, about filial piety. You know, uh, as you know, uh, in the Han phase of the so-called legalist uh, text, there is a chapter called loyalty and filial piety, right? So I think there are different understandings of filial piety. You know, he's, uh, he wants to use filial piety, uh, the one di uh, directional uh, obedience from son to father to promote obedience of subjects to the ruler, whereas the Confucian field path is, uh, you know, too uh, directional, you know, there's a mutual relationship. So I wouldn't say, you know, just because in the Qin law, uh, 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 field path is protected, uh, then it's not purely legalistic. I, I think it could be part of the, the, the Han Fei's uh, design. And the second question you say, you know, uh, Han Fei wants to have a law that, that can be applic applicable to everyone, whereas in Qin and Han laws, you know, uh, you have if you have different ranks, uh, you get different treatments. But still, you know, there is kind of a, uh, some kind of universality, you know, it doesn't matter uh, who you are, as long as you have this rank, you will be treated this way. I mean, even in contemporary American legal system, you know, if uh, 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 a spouse can be allowed not to testify against, uh, you know, uh, the partner, right? You know, so uh, so there's still some kind of universality uh, remaining. And then for Professor Ando, sorry, you know, three questions, so I take a little bit longer. Uh, you know, it's not really a question, it's just purely out of, Ignorance. It's I, I, as you said. It's just uh, maybe the size of Roman Empire is similar to the size of Qin and Han empires, but still the diversity. It's just it's just stunning. And also, it's the uh, the origin uh, of civilizations. It just unified all these areas. That's just amazing. On the other hand, it's just stunning that it, you know, it doesn't uh, take advantage of a centralized bureauc bureaucratic system, which you know the Qin and Han empires uh, developed. Uh, it just, it's always just uh, very stunning to me. It uses laws, but all these, you know, as you said, all these different city states have different laws. Uh, you know, it's not that there was no bureaucracy in those areas. I think the, the Egyptians and certain empires in the Mesopotamian uh, regions, they have uh, Persians, they have kind of bureaucratic uh, empire. So I, I just, I feel that it just, you know, the, the, Roma, the Romans started out as, as a republic, and then it's sort of like a small baby, then suddenly become this very big man, but the baby face hasn't changed. So they used the, the old Republican uh, of regime uh, and then try to apply it to something that's not, uh, not a republic at all. You know, so that's just my, my very uneducated speculation. So I, I'd like to hear your comment on that. Thank you. Paul, you should go first. 
Yeah, so Tongong, some kind of universality, but not the same universality and not true universality. In other words, I agree with you that the ranks of merit um, are, are an example of the kind of um, administrative devices that states were using to try to break uh, the traditional privileges uh, of the aristocracy because that's not a very efficient way of running running your state. And if you want to uh, transition from the Bronze Age to the warring states and be able to compete with all the other states that are doing the same thing and making themselves more efficient than you are, you need to be able to, uh, to, to extract as much talent from your populace and as many resources uh, as possible from, uh, from your uh, territory. So I agree with you that um, uh, you know, legal devices are needed to try to spread um, legal obligations uh, uh, more uh, more widely, and um, um, but clearly not the same thing. So take a look at this. I mean, this is from Shang Jinshu. What is called unifying the law is that there are to be no gradations before the law. So that is, that is literally not how the the law worked. Um, from the ministers of the state and generals down to the grandees and commoners, those who do not follow the king's ordinances, who violate the state's prohibitions or bring disorder upon the sovereign's administration are to be executed without amnesty. That is literally not how the law works. For those who had merit previously, but later failed, the punishment is not to be reduced. That is literally not how the law works. For those who did good service previously, but later transgressed, the standards are not to be vacated. That is literally not how the law works. And as I said, um, the text even recognizes that this is not how the law works um, because elsewhere it, it, it uh, speaks in the language that we now understand much better because of um, you know because of these uh, uh, you know uh, what I'm calling real administrative texts but I'm, I'm even un uneasy about this term real uh, yeah if you have a rank you can avoid punishment and if you don't have a rank it sucks for you uh, it, it, I don't see how you can explain this kind of contrast within the same text unless you say this is a recognition on the part of the authors of the text that this is how the law really does work and this is more like how we want it to be um, but 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 in, in, in reality it doesn't now about Xiao um, Han Feidze recognizes that if you're going to refashion society so that people's rank in society depends entirely on their on their service. Uh, can service. I get a, a, a everything bagel with strawberry cream cheese? That's hilarious. Um, if you want to refashion society so that um, uh, uh, people uh, are rewarded for their for their true service and not rewarded if they don't truly serve the state. Uh, regardless of their surname and their ancestry and so on, you're going to alienate a lot of people. And Hafez uh, also recognizes that there's a lot of traditional notions of virtue. Um, vengeance killing is an example that Hafez uh, talks about that are not really all that uh, helpful from the point of view of the ruler. And they're, they're very difficult to extinguish because the people have these old traditional allegiances to them. Somebody insults your brother, you have to take vengeance. Um, you're not a man unless you take vengeance on somebody who insults your brother. Uh, we, we, need to, we need to suppress this because we can't have people on their own authority deciding um, you know, who's allowed to, uh, um, um, uh, you know, use violence against, uh, against people for purely private disputes. Xiao is one of, in, in Han Fei's view, Xiao is one of those traditional ideals that are nettlesome for the state. Um, could, could we maybe mute or, or eliminate Patrick Kavanaugh? It's very distracting to see him ordering lunch while, while I'm trying to answer this, uh, this question. Um, it's, it's the, the purpose of the Zhong Xiao chapter that uh, Tong Dong is talking about is to show that the Confucians are hypocrites. They talk a lot about loyalty. They talk a lot about filial piety. Um, but in, in reality, they and the heroes that um, they uphold didn't really live up 
to these ideals. And so it's a, it's a, it's a very argumentative chapter, extremely polemical. And, um, and the idea is the whole, the whole virtue is bankrupt. Even the people who are the, 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 the most ardent um, um, uh, exponents of these ideas are, hypocr are hypocrites whose behavior um, you know, didn't didn't conform to to the uh, to the to the expectations of the ideals that they were that they were espousing. Um, so I, I really do think this is another um, unrealistic example of um, a, a, a tr an aspect of traditional society society that Hans Hedge well recognizes that he would um, ideally like to um, ideally like to suppress. Whereas the, the, the legal, last point I'll make, the legal sources are not prepared to take that step yet. Um, the, we can only speculate as to what the, the, the authors of the, of the legal text wanted, but it's clear that they recognized that they couldn't yet dislodge the father from his traditional role of authority within the household. So the, the most they could do is to try to negotiate with the father. Okay, you really wanna kill your son? Fill out a form first. Make sure that it's properly documented, right? Make sure that there's legal grounds for it. Then, okay, then we can go kill your father for you. Uh, um, and the, the one thing you can't do anymore is kill your, kill, 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 not kill your father. That's never acceptable. Kill your son. Uh, the one thing that you can, uh, you can never do is kill, kill your son uh, by yourself. This, the state has to, has to exert the violence now, but we're not prepared to say that fathers can't execute unfaithful sons. And to, I, I read that as a, as a recognition of the limits of the state's power. Um, we, we're, just not, we're just not ready to do that yet. Um, later, yes, later um, the state really does intervene and prevent people from killing their sons. You can sell your son, you, know, you can't kill your son. You have to say two quick things. First of all, I just wanna say one word about status and then I'll say, um, which is not directly replied to what Paul said, but just to illustrate a kind of interesting feature of this diverse citizenship regime, um, which is that uh, for a long time, it remained true that people who held Roman citizenship were somewhat obviously a minority of persons in the Roman Empire, um, despite some sort of more or less systematic mechanisms for giving um, citizenship away. Um, as a reward for various kinds of activities, including service in the army. Um, but um, so one, the Romans maintained something like an exclusive citizenship regime and certain kinds of privileges, but also duties attended upon having Roman citizenship. Quite separately in various aspects of something like administration of law, the Romans gradually developed in something like the second century CE, a kind of a way of distinguishing human beings according to how much dignity they deserve. Like there were people whom you couldn't beat in public and things like this. Um, and these were, these, uh, these legal classifications, these two statuses were essentially, I mean, there were other ways of classifying human beings, but in, this, in essence, in various kinds of uh, um, 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 summary actions by magistrates, you distinguish between people and they just use comparative adjectives who were more honorable, or more humble. Um, and more honorable people, you couldn't, for instance, just randomly beat in public if you didn't, if you didn't think they vacated the sidewalk quickly enough as you were passing through, crap like that. Um, all I want to say about the more honorable and the more humble thing is, um, is that there's no evidence that Roman citizenship, for example, automatically got you into the category of more honorable people. It did not. Um, uh, coming back to this notion of kind of independent republics, the Romans recognized that local systems of stratification had their own logic, and the more honorable people were somehow, you know, there was no reason to believe that merely being Roman, and therefore a citizen of the capital, um, made you a more honorable person. No, no, not in the slightest. Um, yeah, at some level, your description is a, a very fine one, um, uh, that... Um, they started out as a republic and ended up uh, with a giant empire. And um, they did, uh, and therefore at some start, whatever that would, because it took a long time to conquer this place, um, hundreds of years, 
at some moment that you might call an early phase of uh, the empire, um, they administered it as if they were a republic ruling over other republics um, without a huge bureaucracy. At one point I made some calculation and in the early second century CE, the total number of administrative staff of the Roman Empire was smaller than the university when I there once, the smaller than the bureaucracy of the University of Michigan, despite ruling this vast empire of 50, 55 million people. They developed a much more substantial bureaucracy over time, and it came about through a convergence of a number of different pressures. So something like a developing Roman fiscal regime, they came to feel required a census. Um, and this is a kind of interesting extension, right? The, the early Greek and Roman things that we might call a census were developed essentially by archaic cities. It was not a fiscal problem. They were developed by archaic city states to count um, men who are available to serve under arms. And in Rome in particular, the census came to serve a fiscal thing so that people who filled a census return had to report total household wealth. Um, and there was, this, there was a form that they used to report total household wealth by the first century BCE. Um, and there, but it was still of citizens only. And there's a kind of radical moment when the Romans, um, in the interest of kind of universalizing a fiscal regime, um, or at least uh, if not what was taxed, they did want to know how much tax any given locality owed. The Romans all of a sudden turned around and said, this thing which we used to count ourselves, we will now use to count others too. And that, you know, that, that, the, the extension of that is a knowledge technology. The, the scaling of that from the one city state to the entire empire must have been an extraordinary undertaking, even if it was under, even if it was ultimately performed crudely. Um, so that the, and I, I could name some other things, but the, the, there was, they did develop a much more substantial bureaucracy, but it came about for a variety of different reasons. I mean, the census, the, the evidence for the census is then chronologically earlier than much of the evidence for the operation of these assay courts. But if you add up these different trends, you end up, let's say by the year 300, you end up in a very different empire than you were in the year one. Thank you. Uh, ben Gallant, would you please introduce yourself first to then pose your question? Hi, um, my name is Benjamin Gallant. I'm a PhD student at Harvard studying Chinese intellectual history, but I'm very interested in law. Uh, and thank you so much for the panel and, and to the organizers. Uh, I have one question for Professor Golden and one question for Professor Ando. Um, for Professor Golden, uh, you begin with kind of a critique of the category of the legalists, and then you focus on the Han Feizi and the Shang Shu, which are kind of the representative texts. Um, and I wonder if we could draw on the idea of legal pluralism. Um, and so this is an idea in Western scholarship that's a critique of the idea of legal centralism where all the law is just a product of the state. And then kind of expand our categories to deal with all of the different legalist texts that are, or, and all of the different Confucian texts and get away from these problematic categories. Um, and then the question for, Professor Ando is uh, your discussion of the civil versus the military um, and also your discussion of different kinds of law in Gaius's institutes are, are really fascinating. And I have kind of a historiographical question about how we think about the legal tradition in the West and maybe how contact with China might actually shape things uh, because there's a focus on the civil law rather than on military or rather than on criminal law, but also perhaps not so much the military. But if we think about the category of jus gentium um, and how that allows say for captured peoples to become slaves, then that ends up being very important to the civil law too. And in, I, I know for like in English legal history, there's just a desire to focus on the civil law in part because there's more to be said about it that is positive. But if we work towards a total reconstruction of all of the ideas of law and not just the civil law, how might that shape how we compare Roman law versus Chinese law? Because there's a tendency to see it in terms of the privileges given to citizens, uh, which maybe puts an overly favorable spin on Roman law, even though it has lots of um, very intriguing things about it. Thank you. Thank you, 
Yeah, I, I love legal pluralism. Um, my my misgiving is that our sources aren't good enough to um, to to be able to practice legal pluralism with them. Um, I mean, if you if you want to do a ratio of theory to practice in the philosophical texts, it's pretty close to a hundred to zero. And then in the excavated uh, legal manuscripts, it's closer to zero to a hundred. Um, there, there is a little bit of theoretical reasoning that can be inferred, but you don't get too much in the way of um, treatises or discourses of, about the nature of the law, the source, the legitimacy, how it should operate, what kinds of ends it's trying to. You have to infer all that from the uh, from the laws that you encounter, and and in, in practice, more commonly, the, um, the 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 legal problems that you run into. Uh, right, we we don't even know all of the statutes. They come up because somebody is discussing a certain legal problem, and then we can say, "Ah, well, this is something that they're interested in." Um, so, I mean, the impetus for 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 what I was wanting to uh, to do is the sort of blithe acceptance uh, on the part of a lot of people who work on um, excavated legal sources that the authors must have been legalists. If you take the great translation of the Zhang Jiaxian texts by um, Yates and, and Barbieri Low, and I, I almost feel as though I've critiqued them too much on this point because it, it's a tremendous achievement and their their analysis, and not just the translation, but their analysis of how uh, a case would proceed, the, the nature of punishment and so on, is very, very fine. But when they talk about who was writing these, they just call, the, they just call them legalists and, and as though that were sufficient. Um, well, there's many problems with just calling these people legalists. Um, and one of them is, what legalism are you talking about if they're the ist of that ism? Um, because the, the, the very unrealistic philosophy that comes out of Han Feizhen and Shang Jing Shu is not the same. Um, and it's not just the case that the that the um, people who wrote the real laws weren't capable of applying this vision. Uh, it's it's very clear that they often didn't share the same vision. Um, the the idea we just talked about this of universally applicable laws. Uh, the people who were designing the legal system of, of of early imperial China truly did not believe that that's a good idea. Um, you, you wouldn't craft this whole system of twenty. Uh, 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 formally recognized ranks and start enumerating the privileges that, that are, um, accrue to each rank and have a, a whole, you know, um, sub uh, institution of buying the rank in order to cash it in, in order to avoid conviction. If you truly believe uh, what, I, what I had on the screen before, that it should be universally applicable and it doesn't matter what your rank is and it doesn't matter whether you, you had prior merit, if you truly believed all that, you wouldn't go to the trouble of 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 building this uh, this this whole new um, legal and social system, which required a lot of effort, right? That's not something that was inherited. That was something that had to be that had to be constructed at considerable, um, uh, you know, political uh, cost in in society. So that's really all I mean. Um, I, I I would I, I I'm very sympathetic to um, uh, you know what you're saying. I wish the sources were good enough. For us to be able to identify the sources of each idea that that we detect, um, in some cases only indirectly, uh, in the legal sources that are available to us, you know, um, uh, early China. This is why I love the field and why so many people hate the field. It's not good if you um, like certainty. If you're uncomfortable with uncertainty, it's not the right field for you. Because you know, in contrast to something like the Qing Dynasty, where 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 we have so you know, sources that are so much richer. For early China, often we have you know indirect sources, sources that hint at things, and um, much more just void than than what's filled in. And and the challenge, if you enjoy it, is to try to extract as much as you can from the from the very limited sources that we that we possess. Professor, I know I have another appointment. Do you still have time to quickly answer Ben's question? Yeah, I can. I can at least offer very quickly a, a statement. So um, that's a that's a great point. You're absolutely correct. I 
you skin to him you skin to him in the ancient world does not mean what it meant for uh legal theorists of the late medieval, late medieval period and renaissance um and getting into what the romans meant by use gentium would be 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 a kind of complicated matter i will however say you're you're totally correct um there's a the, the focus on the civil law brings at least two substantial problems um um the, the most important of which is uh uh that um uh the 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 codification of law that took place in the sixth century in Byzantium focused very largely on, on, on civil law. So at some level, the materials that we have that are easiest to read happen to be about the civil law. Um, uh, and this was the material that fascinated, in essence, the scholars who re rediscovered Roman law in the 12th century. Um, uh, And the fact that the codification of Roman law, of civil law, took place in the sixth century means that it took place 300 and, you know, depending on which document you're talking about, let's say 320 years after the universalization of Roman citizenship. So although the sources they excerpt and quote were written in a period in which the empire had a diversity of legal systems, that diversity was of no interest to the people who codified it in the year 550. So there's some kind of trace, they're like ghostly bits where it looks like they might have gone on to say something about non-Roman legal systems that they just, they just cut the sentence off because it was of no, no longer of norm had any normative salience. And the other thing I'll say, I'll just show one thing. Um, if you were to, I, I uh, said I'm in the process of trying to produce a new edition of those Roman laws, specifically statutes passed by the assembly, to be perfectly clear about what I'm talking about when I say a Roman law in this case. Roman laws where we have a copy produced at the time. So we have about 50 different Roman statutes where we have at least one piece surviving from antiquity of the law as it was then circulated on a bronze tablet, if it was from Rome. In a couple of cases, what we have are Greek translations and the Greeks were not committed to bronze as a language, as a medium of publication of law. So these are on stone and they fragment in a different way than, and they corrode in a different way than bronze. <clears throat> this is a map of, I mean, I did this once very, very quickly to illustrate for someone and then scanned it just to save it. This is only about the two dozen that I could remember off the top of my head. But this is where the Roman statutes come from. So it, it, has, it has, again, a very different chronological spread or geographic spread than the theoretical writings we have. Um, and these are almost entirely documents of public law. Um, and uh, the story I did not tell about the so-called kiwitates, to use the Latin plural, about the city-states through which the Roman essence governed is that we do have considerable evidence for Roman interference in their public law operations. Um, for example, Rome more or less demanded that all 2,000 of these city-states um, elect their magistrates. They had to be, uh, and they had to have a council. Um, so that all citizens voted on the magistrates, but the laws had to be passed by a council. But the, the law, when they say that each people makes law for itself, what they meant was, uh, that they went through considerable trouble to constitute each one of these states as what they thought of as a republic, which takes us back to uh, the question from Bai Kondo. Um, uh, so rather amusingly, they interfered a great deal in the public law operation of these cities and then said, yeah, the actual substance of your private law is of no concern to us. Uh, uh, so it, it is a fascinating domain. Thanks for the question. But I, I'm, I'm afraid I need to be elsewhere in Hyde Park very, very soon. So thank you all very much. This was, this was really a lovely event. This was great. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. We have to respect the time of our panelists. Thanks so much for the wonderful talk, you know, fantastic, inspiring conversations and the answers. So let's uh, thank you for all the participants and all the panelists. I you know, deeply appreciate this opportunity. Okay, see and you. Thank you for, and thank you for organizing. Yeah, <laughs> it's my pressure. I learned so much. I have so much. <laughs>
so many questions you want to ask, but you know, we respect, you know, everybody's time. Hope to see you guys in person sometime in the near future.